ask you to take your Bibles this evening and turn to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Our final study in this particular series, hard to believe this is number 17 as we've gone through this. This is the life, all the wonderful sweet aspects of salvation, our responsibilities, what it means to us, what it means to God and all the rest of it and how thankful I am that we're able to have this study. And tonight, I did not plan this particular Bible study because of the debate last night. But as I watched part of it and then turned the rest of it off and watched something else, I, uh, I got to thinking about the Bible study for tonight, thinking, wow, how, how appropriate I believe that it is. And I guess that's just of the Lord. i just thanking the Lord for that. Good to have you with us tonight. Thank you for choosing to come to Timberline. I'm glad you were able to find a church that was open. But I'm so thankful for what you said. You said you were tired of not going to church. That just really speaks to my heart. Thank you so much for being that way. With so many people today looking for every excuse under the sun to miss church, I thank the Lord for those who are hungry for it. And I'm glad you're with us tonight. God bless you. Thank you so very, very much. Genesis chapter 18, we're going to read verses 20 through the end of the chapter, please. Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 through 33. I will read verse 20, ask you to join me on verse 21, and every other verse down through the end of the chapter, please. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be fifty righteous within the city, Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then... I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty be found there. There shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Tonight I want to bring the final Bible study in This is the Life, simply entitled Salvation and the Saving of America. Salvation and the Saving of America. Now, Heavenly Father, help me. I will destroy this outline tonight, I know. But Lord, if you will help me, then folks will be able to look past that. So, Lord, please, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our, and our online family as well, that, Lord, they would be able to understand what is about to be said. And in light of that uh, 
debacle last night, that debate. Lord, help us to hear the truth of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Sodom and Gomorrah were very wicked cities. Not only were these cities where God was not acknowledged, as we would read in Romans 1 in just a little bit, but uh, homosexuality, homosexuality and lesbianism were the big sins of these cities. You see, and this usually happens when, when uh, people no longer acknowledge God in all their thoughts. This is why the Bible says we need to keep God in all of our thoughts keeps us straight. But yet, these folks did not acknowledge God, and homosexuality is one of the stages down. Now, I want you to notice in Apostle Paul's writings concerning homosexuality and lesbianism. Romans chapter 1, you have your Bibles there. Beginning in verse 21, let me read you what the Apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, Neither were thankful, but because vain, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds and four footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, uh, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. This is what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities surrounding them. When you leave God out, there's no telling where you're going to end up. Because the only way to go when you leave God is to go down. However, thank God for 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Oh, hear me now. Most will read Romans 1 or Genesis 18, but will never go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and read verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Thank God for that verse. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. But ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, I want to say something right now, because so often it is taught wrongly. Notice the very first part of 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Heaven is not an inheritance. Heaven is a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so therefore, it's not an inheritance. You don't get heaven because mama was saved or because daddy was saved or because grandpa and grandma were saved or because your pastor was saved. You get heaven by calling upon the name of the Lord as the word of God says in Romans ten thirteen: for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't inherit it. He heaven is not an inheritance. And I want to emphasize that to you tonight. For as many will say, if you're a fornicator, you can't inherit heaven. What is an inheritance? Uh, the rewards that we get up there. God says here of these individuals, he said, that's the way some of you used to be. 
He said, you used to be like this. You used to be effeminate. You used to be like a homosexual. You used to be an abuser of yourself with mankind. He said, but these words, he said, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Understand, heaven is a gift, not an inheritance. My children will not go to heaven because I'm saved. My children will go to heaven because they trusted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. My children will not go to heaven because their mama is saved. They will go to heaven because individually they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their personal savior. Years ago when we visited in Chicago at the Pacific Garden Mission, I witnessed to one of the greeters out front Pacific Garden Mission, the mission where Billy Sunday got saved and where he preached and his life was changed and where Dwight Lyman Moody ministered. Hear me now. I said to him, I said, when did you get saved? And he said, I've always been saved. And I said, no, I'm not that. I said, when did you trust Christ as your Savior? He said, I've always trusted Christ as my Savior. Well, you know what? I've not always been born. I got born at a particular time. And the Bible says getting saved is being born again. I'm sure he was referring to the fact that he was raised in a Christian home and all the rest of it. But if there was never a time when he put his faith personally in Jesus Christ as his Savior, his lost as a ball in high grass. You see, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't get saved by osmosis. You don't get saved by sitting next to somebody that's born again. You don't get saved by going to a good Bible preaching church. No, that doesn't save anybody. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe, believe on his name. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 1 John 5 and verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. There comes a time when we have to put our faith and trust. The Bible says uh, in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with a heart man believeth and a righteous with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. Acts chapter 8 verses 36 through 38. After Philip led the black Ethiopian man to Christ. That was coming up from Ethiopia going to Jerusalem. He was reading Isaiah chapter 53. And after he read Isaiah 53. Of, the Bible tells us that the spirit of God moved Philip to go. And to latch himself onto the chariot. And as I've said a hundred dozen times. It was either a slow chariot or a fast Philip. That's all I can figure out. And he got in there and he said, what are you reading? He says, I have no idea what I'm reading. Is this passage about himself or is he talking about someone else? He commanded the chariot to stand still. Very interesting. And uh, as they go along in the chariot, he said, see, the Ethiopian man says, see, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And he said, uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he said he commanded the chariot to stand still. You see, he had to believe with all of his heart there has to be a time. So was that fellow at the Pacific Garden Mission born again? I can't judge that. But he said he was always saved. I've never known anybody who has always been saved. But I will simply say this. You have to be born again in order to go to heaven. That's not the Bible study. But it's an emphasis that I want to make. There should be a time that you try. You say, what if I don't remember the date? Doesn't matter. You were there when it happened, weren't you? I mean, surely you were there on that day, February 16th, 1964 for me. I didn't remember the date, but I remember the day because I was there. And I looked in the back of my mom's Bible a whole number of years ago. And there it said, Danny Parton was saved February 16th, 1964. I found out my birthday was October the 16th. Always mark that down. Always mark that down. October the 16th, 1955. But I found that out because I was told when my birthday was. It's on my birth certificate, but I wasn't born with that knowledge, but I was there when it happened. But I remember my birth date and I remember my salvation birth date because it was written down. Now, let me go back to the story here. All that to say that heaven is a gift and not an inheritance. You trust Jesus Christ 
as your personal Savior. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. But here's the story. God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness. But before he did, he told Abraham what he was about to do. Well, uh, the reason for this is that God always wants to give those uh, who are lost the opportunity to be saved. The Bible says that God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. That's, that's pretty inclusive, isn't it? And so that our God is long-suffering. Aren't you glad he waited on you? Aren't you glad that he gave you the time you needed to come to faith in Jesus Christ? Aren't you glad he didn't give up on you and get that two by four out with a nail in the end of it and smack you up in the back of the head and just let you die and go to hell? No, he was long suffering to usward. Second uh, Peter 321, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he wanted these folks to have an opportunity to be forgiven and to be cleansed of their sin. But if you'll notice in the story of Abraham, he began to pray for the cities. And he prayed that if there would be 50 righteous people found in Sodom and Gomorrah, that God would spare the cities. And then he prayed for 45, and then 40, and then 30, and 10. He finally got down to 10 people, and he left speaking to the Lord. And if he could find just 10 people who had had their faith in God, I'll use the New Testament terminology because salvation has always been by grace and always been by trusting the Messiah, whether you are trusting the Messiah that was to come, that was promised, or trust the Messiah that already came like we do in the New Testament. It's always been by grace through faith. It's never been by the blood of bulls and goats and sacrifices and incense being burned. That's called the everlasting gospel in the, in the book of Revelation. That means it's always been the same. And what is the gospel? Three ingredients the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And in the, Old Testament, in the Old Testament, it was promised in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the very first promise of a, of a Savior. And so God wanted to give these two cities the opportunity, can I use the term, to be saved. Now, God would have saved both cities if we would have found 10 righteous people. We know Lot was saved because the Bible calls him righteous Lot. That's the New Testament. Righteous Lot was vexed in his righteous spirit, the Bible says. His righteousness, he was, he was, a, he was a, one of God's people. He was saved, if you want to use those terms, and I do. But all he had to do was find nine more. And Lot lived in Sodom for 21 years. Long enough to get a wife, raise a family, had all that going for him pitched his tent towards Sodom, lifted up his eyes and saw the well-watered plain of Sodom and lived there for 21 years. All he had to do was come up with nine more people. That's it. But there weren't even 10. All Lot would have had to done was, was bring nine more people to faith in his God. I'm convinced that had Lot been the witness that he should have been, the two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared from the very wrath of God. And as much as God hates the sins of homosexuality, and he does, as much as he hates the sin of lesbianism, and he does, as much as he hates the sin of bestiality, and he does, as much as he hates the sin of, of transvestism, and he does, as much as he hates those sins, he loves the sinner. And God would have spared those two evil cities if Lot could have just come up with nine more people that were righteous. But there weren't. You see, judgment was pronounced upon Sodom and Gomorrah because of these sins. But now hear the next statement. Judgment was not, uh, judgment was pronounced on the cities because of the sins, but they were not destroyed because of homosexuality. They were destroyed because Lot wasn't a witness. How do I know that? Because Abraham said, if you can find 10, will you spare the cities? And God said, I'll do it for 10. So, yes, judgment was pronounced because of homosexuality and lesbianism. Yes, it was pronounced because of those sins. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Yes, 
But God would have saved both of those cities if Lot would have been a witness in 21 years and come up with nine more righteous people. God is long-suffering, isn't he? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why were Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Because righteous Lot was not a witness for the Lord. I want to say this about America tonight. America deserves the famines that she suffers. America deserves the inflation she promotes. America deserves the laws that have been passed. America deserves the atheism that she has spawned. America deserves the agnosticism that she has produced, procured. America deserves the educational system that she has designed. And America deserves the out-of-control generation that she has birthed. America does not deserve the least of God's blessings. She's turned her back on God. I think about this. The legacy of two men who lived in the 18th century illustrate this truth. The first man was a man by the name of Max Jukes, J-U-K-E-S. I've given this illustration in years past. He was an immoral man and he was a moonshiner. And he never went to church and he married a woman who was just like him. And the second man was Jonathan Edwards, a godly minister who was credited with the igniting of the Great Awakening through his sermons. He married a woman uh, who shared his devotion to the Lord. And of Jukes, more than 1,000 recorded descendants, 300 died prematurely, 100 were sent to prison, 190 were prostitutes, 100 were alcoholics. Of Edwards, more than 700 recorded descendants, 300 were preachers, 65 were college professors, and 13 were authors. Most of you know the name Andrew Murray, preacher and writer of South Africa, had 11 children. Five sons were preachers, four girls married preachers, in the next, and in the next generation, 10 grandsons were preachers, 13 grandchildren were missionaries. See, America has spawned all the negative. God would bless America, I believe, if God's people would do the opposite of what Lot did. America deserves the liberalism that she embraces. America deserves the crime rate that she is excused away. That crime rate would include things like this. There are around 2 million violent crimes reported in America every year. America's divorce rate ranks number two in the world. Newlyweds today stay together for an average of 7.2 years. Nearly 1.5 million babies are murdered by way of abortion in America each year. 97% of all abortions are performed because the child was not wanted. Approximately 30 babies are killed by murderous abortionists every 10 minutes. Many high schoolers surveyed admitted to shoplifting. They also admitted to cheating on exams. And the number of people surveyed who believe that homosexuality is acceptable has increased exponentially. Many Americans say they have never read the Bible, even though 90% say they own at least one. Most Americans do not believe that Satan is a real being. Most Americans do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a real being. More than two-thirds of adults surveyed believe that ethics vary by situations or that there is no unchanging ethical standard of right and wrong. Among those in the 18 to 34 age group, the majority said they hold to the view that ethics change based upon the situation that you're faced with. These are sad things to think about in America. These are actual statistics. When I think about the debacle debate last night, and I think about how America has so far gone away from God, God's people are the only hope a revived church family, revived Christians doing what they ought to do is the only hope for America. Our president is not a Messiah and no president ever has been. Our trust is not in November 3rd. Our trust is in the Lord. I shared with friends just this week what the word of God says, that it's better to put your trust in the Lord than it is to put your trust in, in man, to put it in princes. But no, we... We have our trust everywhere else, don't we? So the Christians in America need to do two things that together would have kept Sodom and Gomorrah from being torched by God. What are those two things? Pray 
and witness. Pray and witness. First of all, and this is the Bible study tonight, Christians need to pray. Luke 18, 1, the word of God says, and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Abraham prayed and God heard him. He besought the Lord to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah from the very judgment hand of God. And God listened to him and said that he would answer. God, I believe, would spare our nation. I believe he wants to. He wants to spare it more than we want to pray for it. If you have your Bible there, there's a wonderful passage in Luke chapter 18. It's the chapter of the potter and the potter's house. One of my favorite little chapters is Jeremiah 18. But beginning in verse 7 and reading through verse 10, notice God's promises here. One is negative and one is positive. He says, at what instant I shall speak, verse 7, concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. You see, we need some Christians in America who will lift up their voices and beseech God to save America and to spare America. Somebody needs to pray for this country, not just pray for their green beans and their mashed potatoes and their eggs and their toast and their hash browns. Need some Christians who will be serious about their prayer life, asking God for grace and mercy. You see, when I think about Abraham, he got on his face and he talked to God, asked God to spare Sodom and Gomorrah, and God said, okay, I will. I'll do it. Isn't that wonderful? God had already pronounced judgment. He was going to torch those two cities. But Abraham said, would you spare it for 10 people? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right, he said. And God said, I won't destroy it if you can find 10 righteous. We know of one righteous one. Well, we know of one who had a righteous soul, a righteous spirit. But I don't know that there were any others. And Abraham said, will you destroy the righteous along with the wicked? And God said, no, I'll spare it. If you can find 10, I'll spare it. But perhaps we should forget about asking Christians to pray for America. Why? Because it's hard enough to get them to pray at all. How many hundreds of times have I said this in 30 years? You can take the prayer life of the average Christian and wad it up in a ball and stick it in your eye and you'd never feel it. Because Christians don't pray. The main reason that Christians don't get their prayers answered is not for the seven reasons that Dr. John Rice mentioned in his famous sermon on hindrances, seven hindrances to prayer, though I believe those are hindrances to prayer. The main reason you don't get your prayers answered is because you don't pray. That's the main reason. What does the Bible say in James? You have not because you ask not. The Bible's pretty clear. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, Paul prayed for his nation. He said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul prayed for his nation, and we ought to pray for ours. Let me ask you a question. Have you spent any time praying for America in the last seven days? I mean, I know I was looking forward to watching the debate last night, but I was disappointed on all points, just about, except... Only one man had the right answers and the other man had no answers, but I just was so disappointed I turned it off. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I did. What I'm saying is this, that ought to drive you to your knees, make you pray for this old country. So have you prayed for America or have you only prayed for your green beans? The Bible says in Proverbs 21 and verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. The king's heart can be turned. 
Paul prayed for his nation. God said the king's heart can be turned. The picture that's drawn in Proverbs 21.1 is not of a mighty rushing river. It's that of a, of a field that has irrigation. And how maybe one row wasn't getting enough water and he would take his foot and he would push dirt so that when the water would run, the, it would hit that dirt wall and go down a particular road. That's what the picture is that's drawn here. As the rivers of water, he turneth it with us whoever he will, you see. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. It's on the front of your prayer bulletin. The Bible says, watch ye therefore and pray always. The Bible says, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Former President Ronald Reagan said this in 1984, and I quote, if not us, who? And if not now, when? If not us, who? If not when now it's very interesting there are satanic groups that are praying against america where are the people of god praying for this old nation number two i said that there were two things that we could do number one is christians ought need to pray number two christians need to witness christians need to witness proverbs eleven thirty, the word of god says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. There are many critics today that say that's not talking about soul winning. Of course it is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. The fruit of an orange tree is an orange. Fruit of an apple tree is an apple. Fruit of a banana tree is a banana. Fruit of a Christian is what? Another Christian. We're to produce other Christians, not by having children and rearing them in a Christian home and leading them to Christ only, but we're to be bringing people to faith in Christ, our witness. As I said, had Lot been a witness and been the witness that he should have been, God would have spared the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about that. All the responsibility was on whether or not he in 21 years could come up with nine other people. But in 21 years, he couldn't come up with nine. Abraham said it right. Will you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous, with the wicked? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Lord, would you spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah who are committing horrible, egregious uh, sexual immorality with homosexuality and lesbianism and bestiality and everything else can you imagine? And God said, okay, I'll spare them. Find me ten. Find me ten. Abraham surely thought that Lot would have at least won his family to Christ. Instead, they won him over. And all that was needed to save the cities were ten righteous, that is, ten people who were saved. And we know that Lot was saved. The Bible says righteous Lot, righteous spirit. If he would have simply won his wife, his two daughters and their husbands to the Lord, he would have only needed four more people to spare the cities in 21 years. 21 years. But his wife was lost. His two sons-in-law stayed behind. There is no record that his daughters were ever coming to faith in God. And for more than 20 years, he lived in Sodom and didn't have a single soul saved, not even his family. Not even his family. There is no testimony in the word of God that he tried. There's no testimony anywhere in the word of God where he was a witness of any kind to his family. Just that God destroyed the cities because there were not ten righteous people. Lot's testimony was so poor that he thought it nothing to lie as to whether or not his daughters were even married. He offered them as virgins to the wicked men and women of Sodom and Gomorrah. So are you a witness for the Lord Jesus or is your, is your life a witness against him? No one in Sodom and Gomorrah knew Lot was saved. No one. Not that we know of. The Bible gives no testimony that anybody knew Lot was saved. He had a position in the city. He sat in the gate, probably the mayor of the city. He had a place of leadership in the city. He had been there 21 years, raised a family found a wife. No record anywhere in the Bible that anybody even knew that he was a 
follower of God at one time anyway. If America is, will ever come back to God, America is going to be brought back one soul at a time. And as I said earlier, former President Ronald Reagan said in 1984, if not us, who, and if not now, when? If not us, who, and if not now, when? So to bring this Bible study to a close tonight, and I know this has been very, very heavy, I realize that. And it's really been more of a sermon than it has been a study, though there's been a lot of study material being given out. The saving of our nation is a complex thing, but it is as simple as practicing two simple things. Pray without ceasing, and go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. That's it, those two things. You realize when you go back to Sodom and Gomorrah in this story, those are the only the two ingredients that God would have blessed. Abraham prayed, and Lot, if he would have witnessed, the two cities could have been spared. And I wonder if God would do that for America. If God's people would get serious about their prayer lives, and if God's people would get serious about getting the gospel out. That track rack out there. Now, I know we have less people now than we used to. Folks have moved away. I realize that. But I remember I used to fill that track rack every week. It holds 1,500 gospel tracks. And that's if you don't squish them real tight. If you squish them real tight in the track rack, you can put a whole lot more in it. But I used to fill it every week. I don't fill it every week now, and I understand we have less folks. I understand that. But with the folks that we do have, are the tracks going out? I love it when people visit our church. They go to our track rack and they fill their purses and their pockets with our tracks. I think that's a wonderful thing. They're interested in getting the gospel out. But you might be surprised who would actually read one of those gospel tracks, like the, like the Arab young man that I spoke to at the gas station a few years ago. I went in to pay for my gas and he was the attendant there and I handed him one of God's simple plan of salvation tracks. When I walked out of the place, he was leaned up against the counter, had it open, and he was reading it. He was reading it. I'm talking your waitresses and your waiters and your store people and Walmart employees and city market people and all the rest of it. You remember me telling you the story about two of our teenagers who up, up in Woodland Park who I got a call from the Woodland Park High School principal. He called me and said, some of your young people are putting your gospel pamphlets in our teacher's mailboxes. And I want you to take care of it. And I said, oh, I will, because I knew exactly who it was. I pulled those two girls in, and I said, I, understand. I got a call from your principal this week. And I understand you all have been putting gospel tracts in the teacher's mailboxes. Yes, Pastor, we have been. I said, I have something to say to you. I said, keep it up. Keep it up. Don't stop. Keep getting those gospel tracts in those lockers and in those mailboxes. Keep on getting the gospel out. And both of those young ladies to this day are still serving the Lord to some capacity. And that's a great blessing. Don't miss what I'm saying here. Sadly, these are the two areas, praying and witnessing, where most Christians fall short more than any areas in their life. Do you pray? Do you witness? We ought to do what we can to help save our nation. You heard what went on last night if you watched any of the, of the debacle, the, the debate, whatever you want to call it. This whole country needs Jesus, and it needs him desperately. And the unsaved are not going to share the gospel. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So you can't count on the unsaved getting the gospel out. Lord, Lord, did not we do many mighty things in your name? Yeah, a lot of things are mentioned there, but witnessing is not one of them. The unsaved are not interested in getting people saved. Dr. John R. Rice said that you ought to be walking around and passing out tracts all the time to where you're like a leaking seed basket everywhere you go. One person wrote and said, Christian ought to be recognizable by the tracts that he leaves behind. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. One of our men one time was at Walmart witnessing to someone at the sports counter. One of our other people listened to him as they witnessed. All I'm saying is this, is that there's a whole world out there that needs the Lord Jesus. But you know what? We can't touch the whole world. We've got a community that we can touch. And we can touch it and nobody else can. America needs you to pray. And America needs you to witness. 
And those of you who are listening online, this message is for you as well. It's for you as well. I remember that one of my friends who works at a radio station here in town had me come on their radio station and present the gospel, did it a number of times. I don't know how many thousands of people heard it. How many people got saved? I don't know. I don't know if anybody did. But the gospel went out. What I do know is this, is that nobody else is going to do it. We have to take that responsibility upon ourselves. So grab you some gospel tracts on the way out the door. Give yourself a goal. Most people are scared to death to pass out a gospel tract. They're not scared to pass out anything else, but they're scared to pass out a gospel tract. Grab 10, and in the next seven days, pass out 10 gospel tracts. Or give yourself a number to do, and then fulfill that as the week goes on. Shall we stand?